you're in the right place. Hello, I'm Dan Harris. Hi, and I'm Claudia Kastler. You're over here, over there. Welcome to Over Here, Over There, a global conversation about how we see ourselves and how others see us. I'm your host, Dan Harris, and for the next 45 minutes, we'll be asking some stellar guests from Germany, UK, and Japan about our topic of conversation today, entitled Sprechen Sie Small Talk? Why Some Countries Would Rather Not. You can send us your feedback via our website at overhereoverthere.org or on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Small talk is one of those interesting topics that admittedly I had a cultural blindness spot until two people brought it to my attention. I like to think of myself as a well-traveled soul, but didn't realize the importance of small talk at so many levels for people across the globe. First was my brother Charles, who is currently teaching English in Japan and who finds it challenging to adapt and connect and small talk with his students and life in general in Osaka, but he says he's gradually making progress. The other is my fellow podcaster, Claudia Kussler, editor of the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Munich, who said that it's definite issue in Germany, which we'll learn more about. Claudia grew up in Bavaria and has an eclectic background, having lived in California and Iceland and London, and in fact speaks Icelandic and has traveled widely. Claudia, small talk wasn't a problem when we first met in early 2020. What did I get right? <laughs> Probably everything. <laughs> or what did I get do wrong? Well, uh, not much. <laughs> well, uh, to quote um, Tom Jones, it's not unusual to be loved by anyone, but uh, <laughs> to have uh, such a fluent and entertaining and yet light small talk, yes, that can be unusual, at least in Germany, I think. Um, but like with everything else, there's no hard and fast rule or cliche. So... Uh, small talk still can happen like it did with us that night. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Our three guest contributors I like to think of as small talk aficionados or the Marvel superheroes of chit chat. They are BBC and commercial radio presenter Warren Moore, who went to university in the US and knows a thing or two about American basketball, which I <laughs> deeply appreciate. Also with us is Yuka Agura, who is a Japanese cultural advisor based in Iceland. Yuka has lived in Iceland since 2017 and has a long association with that amazing country. She is also well known to be the guru on all matters regarding the Carpenters musical group. <laughs> Perhaps you'll give us a rendition of Close to You, along with our small talk conversation. We're delighted also to have psychotherapist Margaret Cavanaugh, who is American, but from her British accent, you'd never know it since living in the UK from the age of three, just as you wouldn't suspect me of being British with my American accent. It's a crazy world. Welcome, welcome all, and thank you for being virtually over here and over there with us. Small talk, as I mentioned, I didn't quite understand the problem until, in fact, Claudia brought it up and my brother brought it up in, in that it was an issue. And I just blundered my way into every country I went into and just as a typical American, I think, and started talking. Uh, but I want to get my head around it. And I found this article in the Harvard Business Review by Malinsky and Hahn. And I want to see how it, it plays with you guys. It says, small talk is a non-transactional conversation. Information exchange has no intrinsic value, but can signal social acceptance, outreach, or indicate a willingness to conform to social expectations. It's a lot to think about at the moment, but it, it, it has no kind of transactional value, but it has something else. And this is probably what, it, what we have to get to today. What do you think about that? Let's go with Margaret. What does small talk mean to you? Um, well, actually, I think it's it's really interesting because it's small talk. I sort of think it was like dogs sniffing each other. It's it's how you get close to people. How you, how you, you know, you're just sussing things out and understanding so much. You understand people's mood, people's emotion, their intellectual level, uh, whether they're pleased to see you, whether they're... Through a sniff? Through a sniff. <laughs> well, apparently dogs know all of that. They can sniff a lamppost and know that. We actually have to talk to a person. So, um but I think it is really interesting how much you gauge and talking about it in an international perspective, having lived in France, if you don't understand the little social rules, the small talk has a different value because you don't get the little signals. Whereas when you're in England, you can pick up those signals, just accent, all sorts of things. But when you're, you're in a foreign country, even if you speak the language, if you don't really understand that very subtle, subtle, those subtle rules, it's much more difficult. And I think small talk is that way in. The definition more mentions intrinsic. So 
which is kind of like essential value, but it does have a value, right, of sorts. As Margaret was saying, there's a lot of externalities to the communication than just a straight transaction. We talked offline about something else regarding small talk being more relationship oriented. Yeah, I really love Margaret's analogy there, even though we might all end up in prison once that um, ends up being broadcast. But I think she's she's right, you know, and, and small talk's taken on such a greater meaning, certainly in the United Kingdom during our many and frequent lockdowns. It reminded me of an incident that happened in the first lockdown over the summer. Um, I live in, in, in Gloucester in the docks and there's a security guy. He was the only person I saw that day. And for 45 seconds, we engaged in just a little bit of small talk. And that put a smile on my face. And it's what it's led to since, you know, we'll sit down and we'll have a coffee and we'll have a chat. So sometimes small talk, it, it, it's that sort of um, audio audible handshake just to say hello. It's your, it's your if you like, conversational um, uh, calling card, if you like. And I really like what Margaret said there. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's get to the, the countries that find it difficult in a way, or it's challenging. Claudia, what happens in Germany? What did you first think of me when I was talking across the table? Of course, you know, we were in a kind of a setting, you know, it was very jovial, fun and all that. But there we were in a social setting. We had like other others around us. What was challenging about that in, in Germany? Oh, Claudia? I think we lost her. Oh, Either that or Claudia is not great at small talk. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's back. Now. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Yeah. I'm, joining I'm us. so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold well on. I lost the connection. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> that was the a demonstration, actually. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, great to have Claudia back. I think you heard the question, but. What made that night work? Because none of us around the table really knew each other. I think it was a very eclectic mix of people coming together for a joyous occasion, the birthday of a uh, friend, and we all had different backgrounds. And I think we all were in a state of mind to be very open and uh, interested in each other's lives and uh, each other's topics. And uh, so it was kind of a very special day where everything came together. You were in a, in, a, in, a, in a good mood. You came from a, well, let's say a little bit exotic island <laughs> at that time. <laughs> and uh, you made your way over there for a birthday. So that was a good start, you know, to get to know you. And then we could all chip in with various uh, little details and questions. And it was a mindset of a lot of people being open, curious, and interested. Uh, and that was probably the magic key to it on that very, very night. You know, I often experienced that similar magical thing, flow going on when I'm abroad. And I remember one of the um, earliest memories I had when I was, with, was moving actually to uh, Iceland was that some uh, people who later became friends in Iceland, they started off with a joke uh, saying that how many Germans does it take to change a light bulb? One, because you are so efficient and have no humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, so friends, friends and for that, friends for life after that, right? Eh? Well, they came, they became friends later. <laughs> After the international diplomatic this, incident, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, there is some kind of truth maybe behind that joke, because of course Germans are considered efficient. And sometimes, especially in the business world, uh, small talk can be seen as something to put off the uh, more interesting points or the uh, to lay off uh, the, the deeper conversations that are necessary. So uh, sometimes you feel as a German, you have to go right into the deep matter, you know, and that is something you, have, you, you are kind of trained to it. And on the other hand, when we're talking about uh, office chat or something like that, or uh, chatting with neighbors, there's always the fine line of not getting into gossip. And that is mm. quite something everyone fears, that small talk turns into gossip very easily. Mm. It is so a fine you, line, a isn't lot it? Of it's a fi yeah, fine line. Yeah, it is. And so a lot of Germans are very afraid of being uh, the starting point of gossip or 
also, of course, the center of gossip. So they kind of avoid it altogether, not to go into that uh, minefield, you know. So you have those two paths and you have to navigate through that, you know, not to be hard-nosed with your deep facts and putting people off by just saying, hello, how are you? And did you vote for Trump or Boris Johnson? <laughs> um, and on the other hand, not being a chitter-chatter, you know, turning into a gossiper. So just to avoid that uh, difficulty, Uh, the position you might be in, um, people are kind of, uh, they, they tend to just not uh, get into the matter of small talk altogether. Mm. They keep it straight and simple. And uh, this has kind of developed probably over the years in the society. So this is why we seem efficient. Let me turn to, to Yuka. From a Japanese point of view, in Japan, I know you're in Iceland at the moment, mm -hmm. and you can comment on Iceland in, uh, if, you, if you'd like. Generally, what is the state of small talk in Japan? Well, um, I just have to tell you that I've been working independent and just my, in my own shell, so I don't really small talk much at all with people. So I'm not really sure what I can really say about it. But anyway, I have to say that Japanese is a bit shy. And also, I think it's because of that our society is pretty much like ugly culture oriented. And then, which means that you are just staying in the same place, uh, seeing the same people. So you know what their uh, lives are just uh, so you don't really have to talk about it. You just know it. I think that's just the basis of how we are in general. But then, you know, in the in the States, I was really uh, surprised for the first time I went there. And of course, I knew that they're just asking, like, how are you? We don't do that. We don't say that. It's because uh, we could, you know, maybe talk about weather, but that's all. And then um, when I get asked, like, how are you? It's like um, I have to answer. That's like a very uh, high stress. All you have to say is, I'm doing good. Thank you. But then at the same time, I feel like I have to say, okay, you know what? Last night I spoke with my mother and she was really um, <laughs> mad about me going out with this yeah. guy or something. So... Um, I don't know how to actually personally. I don't know how to grasp a small talk. I have difficult. I still have difficulty doing the small talk, and I, I have difficulty talking about it. <laughs> do you, <laughs> do you, I don't do, know if, you have, if I'm making any sense out of this. No, it's a challenge. It's Perfect a challenge. What you're saying, and do, yeah, yeah. and do you have so? Do you yeah, have? You are do you have sense, more? Yeah. Is, it, is it easier in Iceland, or is it harder uh, or is, than than I Japan, have, or is, where is it? Where is it? Easier. I have to say that it's easier um, speaking in English because it's English language they're talking about, you know, do small talk. In Japan, we don't really do it. And uh, just like Claudia said, like, um, you want to talk to them and just to, to show that you you like the person and you want to talk to them, you have nothing against them. But at the same time, you don't want to get into really small details about their lives and your own life either. So you have to navigate the, the like fine line, just like Claudia said. Warren, as a, as a radio host in the, in the UK, you make a living on small talk and engaging conversation. That's a way of life for you, really, isn't it? What makes, in your mind, a good small talker? I think, actually... There are, there are two major things that I find personally. One of them is an ability to what you might describe, for want of a, a better phrase and a better term of island hop, that you can move from a good dozen or so different topics, whether that's politics, whether that's the classic British small talk of the weather or current affairs or sport or anything like that. So it's kind of that ability to be, and, and this is a great sort of British phrase that I hope translates, of um, jack of all trades, master of none that you can scoot around lots of different topics and know a little about a lot. But also I think one thing, you know, we've used the word small and the emphasis on the talk. I think to be a good small talker, it's, it's pretty imperative that you're actually a good listener, that you can take on board what the other person, what the other party, he or she is saying in the conversation and move it along that way. Exactly. It's a two-way and- Yeah, I it's think a two-way street. It gets confused, it gets confused, especially as a radio host or as someone who's very good at small talk, you think you're being talked at, but what you're saying is the way it works is that by listening, you're getting back to that intrinsic value, you're yeah. valuing that other person. And, and I, absolutely. When I'm with you on the radio, you know, you're listening closely, and then you're feeding back to me what I said. I feel valued and it, it creates a relationship, which we have. Yes, exactly. And, and it is that thing of, of creating the relationship. 
And it was interesting to hear both Claudia and Yuka talk about this from a from a, 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 a different perspective in terms of what it can lead to uh, and the relationship that will build from there. And I think um, uh, to go back to something that Margaret touched on earlier on, it's kind of that sort of verbal calling card of we can build a relationship here. We can continue. You are someone that is effectively on my wavelength. The chemistry is good here. Um, uh, and it's kind of almost a way of in a funny way, good small talk can make someone calm, can make someone receptive, and it can also sort of lead to the defences coming down a little bit as well. That leads on very well to asking Margaret, who's a psychotherapist, about empathy. We're listening to someone. That's your profession, isn't it, Margaret? And there's something, I think more than just uh, medicine, there's something about being a human being, certainly in, in England, where being connected to others is really, really important. And that is being heard and being able to speak to them. And there was recently, talking about lockdown, there was recently an article in The New Scientist saying that actually they found one of the major factors in well-being during lockdown was people were not having the acquaintances. They were seeing people they really, really knew really deeply, but they were missing out on those acquaintances. Like you were saying, Warren, that guy that you just said hi to. And that is really important to human beings to, to make themselves feel that they're connected to a whole connective network. And it was really surprising how important those acquaintance relationships were. And I think that's all about small talk. That's, you know, it, it's it's being heard, being valued, being seen, and being seen in a in a larger network in the community, which is very important. But in in a therapeutic level, the the small talk uh, quickly goes down because it's a different environment. It's an environment where you immediately you start with a small talk just to get the big, you know, to 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 ease the action. But you go straight into the more deeper, like you were talking about, Claudia and Yoko, those things, the much deeper level. So. That, that's where small talk comes in, just as an entrance. It's a doorway, and sometimes that doorway's longer and sometimes it's shorter to really connect with another person. You're listening to Over Here, Over There, and I'm your host, Dan Harris, with fellow podcaster Claudia Kussler, senior editor of the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and our guest, PPC and commercial radio host Warren Moore, British and American psychotherapist Margaret Cavanaugh, and Yuka Agura. Japanese cultural advisor based in Iceland. And our topic is Sprechensee Small Talk, Why Some Countries Would Rather Not. Claudia, as far as empathy, how much of an imperative is the, the tone of small talk? Especially in, in Germany, the stereotype is you're cold and direct. To me, it has a lot to do with, in what Yuka was saying, it has a lot to do with trust. You don't know that person. And, the, and I find it also as an American in Britain in the same way, where Americans are free and easy, you know, for some reason, I don't know why. When I first came over here in Britain, I felt like I had to be introduced to someone first before I even started small talk. You know, that was many moons ago, but still. What about in Germany? Well, it, um, I can only speak uh, of, um, yeah, from my perspective. And I think to keep the tone light is very important because, as Margaret, you said, it's a calling card. It's the entrance. And there is always the possibility that you don't get along with someone or you don't find the other person interesting. So you have to uh, have the opportunity to go out of this relationship and not proceed it any further without anyone being hurt by it. So by keeping it light and airy and, and, and maybe a little bit fun, you have all the options open. If you start uh, a small talk with a quite deep topic and you really crawl into someone else person's mind and uh, want to get to know them what about they don't want to have that back if they shut down then you put all that effort in and uh, the result is nothing and you kind of uh, <laughs> yeah you lost a bit of energy and you lost a bit of your spirit maybe so it is very important to keep it light in the beginning, just to sniff around where it can actually lead and then proceed and take every little step from there. But I tell you something, when I come back from Great Britain, I'm always in a, a little bit lighter when I go shopping because then I am used to uh, the shopkeeper saying, hello, love, to me. Um, <laughs> it might, you, you might not longer notice it or, or seem it special, but to me it's like... <gasps> <laughs> oh, how how friendly, how nice. 
uh, that was something special and precious to me. Mm -hmm. And when I come back here in Germany, I suddenly notice that the shopkeeper doesn't say, hello, love, or accordingly uh, in German to me, but he says, what do you want? And that all of a sudden sounds quite rude. When I'm longer here back in Germany, I don't notice it anymore. And I just know that's the way and they don't mean anything by it other than opening the uh, the shopping process with yeah. me. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of a mindset. I, I uh, When I'm getting abroad, I have to be a bit more open uh, to the ways uh, others do it. And I very much appreciate it. And when I'm back here, I have to get used to it, that it's a bit rougher, a bit more on the nose, but it's not meant uh, badly in any way. It's not something, uh, th it's not something that they want to be rude, but it's just um, a fashion or a habit. And I have to keep that in mind and keeping things in mind that other persons, other um, countries, other nations are different is very important because Yuka, we met in Iceland yes. and I was so nervous about meeting you Why? because I, I <laughs> haven't been to Japan at that time mm -hmm. and I only heard about Japanese people being extremely polite and they have so many rules about that. They have to bow in a certain way. You have to get the business card with two hands and you have <laughs> to, you, you can probably just do everything wrong as a foreigner. So I uh, wanted to be friendly with you mm -hmm. and I was terrified that I would do something wrong and you would misunderstand or mislead it. And you were so open and so friendly and Probably I've done everything wrong, but the fact that we both were on a foreign ground mm -hmm. in Iceland True. and you were so open-minded and you've been around, we actually connected and I was uh, no longer afraid, you know, Great. And so we, <laughs> we, we can <laughs> proceed. But um, now that we rekindled our relationship, mm -hmm. I was getting nervous again oh. uh, was I was I too direct and I was questioning my ways of course and I can only hope that you are taking it not as too direct or too rude not at all but I'm trying to learn and uh, this is what I'm hoping to express to everyone we should all keep our minds open about others and not directly shut down when it seems rude, but it might just be something uh, people are not familiar with, you know, with their ways. Dan, it, go ahead, go ahead, Warren. Isn't it interesting how something that is so um, important and, 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 and we all do this as a, as, a, as a global community in terms of, of, of communicating through small talk, but we almost belittle it by just calling it small talk, when actually the consequences and, and, and the great things and the great payoffs we can get just by having a small talk conversation are huge. Um, I remember going to the States for the first time when I was a student over there and being sort of mortally concerned that I'd, I'd mortally offended a lot of people there because at the end of a phone conversation, a lot of North Americans don't say goodbye. It'll just be click and that's it. Whereas over here in the United Kingdom, and I think in Europe as, as a whole, we'll have like a 20-minute phone conversation and 15 minutes of that is basically being polite and saying goodbye. So it's just, <laughs> it's almost something that is so is so vitally important and yet we don't, I'd be interested to know what Margaret thinks about this, we don't have any uh, education on this in schools or, 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 you know, the only education we seem to get is, is it just something that right. mom, and dad, mom and dad did from a very sort of early age, you know, as our subconscious is developing from sort of birth to about seven. If mom and dad or parents or guardians were into small talk, then it's something that we kind of just take on board subconsciously anyway and run with in later adult life. Margaret, you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think there's definitely, we pick it up, don't we, from around what we're saying. And I, I was actually, I from American parents, was brought up to make conversation. You know, you go into this room and you hold the fort, mm -hmm. make conversation. It could be somebody from prison or it could be a bishop sitting in the kitchen. But I had to make conversation So my mother had came downstairs and it was a, it was formally taught to us. Ask them about themselves was the question we were 
we were told to say, always ask people about themselves. And yet listening to you, Claudia, and going, gosh, that would be so intrusive Mm -hmm. to do in Germany, Mm -hmm. you know, but that, (laughs) that was this formal thing. But the bottom line is, I think we do pick it up subconsciously. We pick up the social mores and the, in every country, it's about not offending. Mm -hmm. So in Germany, it's don't gossip, don't cause offense. You know, in Japan, what you seem to be saying, Yuka, is, you know, don't don't be intrusive. Mm. Don't make people have to navigate all this stuff. Don't get it wrong. So I think we do pick up from our own cultures. Mm-hmm. But and I wonder whether my experience is being brought up as an American in the UK, whether in America where people are uh, much the more open with small talk and talk and have fewer, you know, uh, inhibitions about it, whether it is actually taught explicitly, where in other countries you do pick it up when not to and when to speak. It'd be quite interesting. Yuka, uh, do you have any, do you have any victories, victories. as far as, uh, or, you know, because you mentioned how, <laughs> how, how challenging it is and how you don't like it in a, in a sense, but do you, do you, any successes that you could say, yeah, I, you know, I got on and I, I made that, I made that work. Um, I think it's just a very different culture, I have to say. Um, uh, I know that for, and I think it's very hard to understand Japanese, what Japanese people are thinking, because we don't really voice it. It's more like sensing. Um, like I live with my husband, who is an Icelandic, and he, of course he was brought up here in Iceland, and I was brought up in Japan. So I have to always try to voice it. Like if I want to have a cup of tea, it's not that I'm making my husband a servant, but then um, I have to say I have to voice it. Like I would like to have a cup of tea, but in Japan probably it's more like. If there's a teacup, you just have to like point out and kind of smile or whatever, then they'll sense it. That's what you're supposed to do. They're not, you're not, if you voice it, it means that you are not able to tell what they wanted, which means that you, you, you just felt. If you have to, to voice mm. something and the, 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 the partner didn't really sense it, it's like a failure already. So we're not really supposed to voice it. That's the, uh, the thing. So the small talk doesn't have to take place in Japanese culture to begin with. That's why it's so hard to do the, to start the conversation, you know. Um, that's one thing I can say. And Claudia, thank you very much that I was very accepting and all that. I tried to. And at the same time, I really loved speaking with people. But again, it's the same thing. I am afraid that maybe I'm being rude to the people. I hope I, you know, they don't take me wrong and all that. So if I, I can't, because of my upbringing, I'm not really good at spe- start speaking with people. But if they ask me questions, if they start talking to me, I can respond. So I think it just it has a lot to do with the the cultural uh, difference, and um, you know the the environment where you're brought up, and all the the different stuff. It's so <laughs> it's so complicated, actually. It is, isn't it? And uh, we are all lucky enough to uh, have been traveling a lot and um, learned a lot from that. But um, Warren, what you actually said about bringing it uh, as a topic to schools, might that be something uh, interesting? Well, I just think it's it's one of those things that, that um, we'd all benefit from. Just listening to us around here and, and the different cultural complexities of negotiations makes me, me think of how on earth did they even manage to get a Brexit deal done with 27 <laughs> different nationalities <laughs> around one table. Now, I know Dan's tearing his hair out thinking we said we wouldn't mention Brexit, but it does, and, and it makes me appreciate it uh, from someone that grew up uh, around two parents that were very chit-chatty and... and um, and, uh, and able to, as Margaret said, basically, bam, I'm just going to chuck you in the 12 foot deep end and we'll see how you get on. That's almost the best way to do it, but it would be nice if you were just given a few little rules on the etiquette and where to go. And, and I think almost importantly, where not to go as well in terms of small mm. talk and reading the signs and signals as well. Um, so mm. it's very, very interesting and a really real big learning curve for me to experience what you guys go through just culturally in terms of, um, you know, as, as Yuka was talking and, and uh, earlier, Claudia before that, in terms of saying we're not so much into that from a, a Germanic point of view, it's straight into business. It's very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. From an American point of view, and Margaret can help me with this, <laughs> and Americans want to know, what does class 
bring into this mix when it talks to small talk because you have the queen and you know set the tone for the you know the rest of the country it does it have class implications like uh, you're only supposed to you know, speak when you're spoken to that sets that sets an example from the top down doesn't it anybody can go into that one margaret yeah yeah i mean i was thinking about a bit about um what i think it was Claudia, somebody said before, but also you're protecting yourself. So actually, small talk is about the veneer. It's really about hiding what's really going on and then slowly revealing that. So you learn to not give away too much of yourself, to protect yourself a little bit with small talk. It's all out there with the other. And I wonder whether you're also gauging this people's social class at the same time when you're, when you're talking like that. And I don't know, but in America, whether, you know, the sort of people who would consider themselves to be higher class seem to be more restrained than people who are lower class. Um, I don't know if that's, you would say that, Dan, but there's an element of, you know, that you abide by much more formal etiquette rules, uh, depending on your class, where you're much more relaxed about things. I, I don't know. What do you think? That could be true. And also the fact that you have, in a sense, more to protect. Mm. <laughs> you have more resources, more wealth, you don't want to give certain things away about yourself. Mm. You're a little bit more more guarded. Mm. It's it's always funny to hear people with high social status or wealthy, and someone would say to that about that person, "Oh, he's so down to earth. He's so down to earth." But because yeah. so, what does that mean? Well, that means he well he he'll talk to me. But anyway, yeah, I I, I I take your point. It's a very it's a very good point, and I just find here also though that being an American, that was. It was easy. I was an outsider. You know, I would trample over rules and things like that. I didn't know when I observed the British talking amongst themselves. There was a definite distinction in, in small talk as far as who would talk to who, and how you would begin that conversation. And I, I just found that fascinating. Fascinating. You're listening to Over Here, Over There, and I'm your host Dan Harris with fellow podcaster Claudia Kussler, and our guests were more Margaret Cavanaugh and Yuka Agura. And we're discussing the value of small talk in today's globalized world. We're nearing the end of the podcast, but looking back on the title, Sprechensee Small Talk, Why Some Countries Would Rather Not, let's make sure we address it. Why do some countries find small talk important and others less so? Margaret? No, I would say, though, that the very fact that we're having this conversation, that we're noticing it and we're noticing there are social differences and we're noticing there are cultural differences, that's the, that's the beginning to make it um, much more useful. Just not acknowledging it, that's the first step. And knowledge that there are cultural differences and that people are different, not to be rude, but because they're trying to protect you in different ways. These rules are designed to oil the wheels of society mm. and that's why we want to respect them yeah. yeah very true i think as well dan i think it's been fascinating to hear how it works in other countries uh, and and hopefully uh, as we begin to come out of this global pandemic and maybe maybe just use zoom uh, and the platform zencast that we're using today I, I would wonder just out of interest we've all been extremely grateful for the great technological advancements that we've we've received over the past five years that have allowed us to keep in touch with it. But I just wonder if we'll take small talk um, more importantly, once we get back out into our communities once again, and it doesn't have to be small talk via a, a laptop screen or something like that, or a mobile phone. Yuka, what's, what's, what's the future for small talk and, with you in Iceland and, oh, and Japan. The, the and thing is, I have difficulty speaking with people because I've been locked. Um, it's it's not there's no lockdown in Iceland, but I've been staying at home for the whole entire year. I was going to go back to Japan, but because of this pandemic, I was not able to. And I work independent, so I don't really work with anybody else. I, I'm just independent. So I'm just locked in the house in a way. So I haven't really been able to speak with anybody. So if I see somebody at the supermarket and they say, how are you? I go, oh, I don't know what to say. So I have to, I, I think I have to rehabilitate. That's what I want to say. Uh, in, this, uh, in, you know, I uh, probably, uh, it's just depending on people like my husband who goes to work and meet all the ki all kinds of different people, just as he used to do before pandemic. 
And people like myself, I don't really go out. I, I don't really work with anybody like specific. And uh, I just don't meet people. So I don't know how to talk really. And I really got shocked about myself uh, being with uh, everybody here for like four or five people. I don't know what to say really. So at like I think up to some extent, everybody's like this. We don't know what how to talk and what to talk anymore. So we have to rehabilitate. Maybe it's a nice reset of uh, starting the small talk again in a different way, maybe. Great point. That's a lovely yeah. idea. Yeah. That's a very good point. I mean, with Zoom, with Zoom. <laughs> and on top of that, you had to get used to the medium of Zoom and the etiquette there. It's just mm -hmm. whether you're sitting down at a table or at the water cooler or at Zoom or whatever, and then suddenly you're out of practice. And I, I think that's brilliant what you just said there as far as rehabilitation. Claudia, any last thoughts? Uh, I feel not as good as Yuka's. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think uh, the, a restart is probably the best term to say it. We all have a, a possibility now um, because of the lockdown. We suddenly noticed how much we miss going out, how much we miss with being with other people and uh, and counter different cultures so that might be the, the the perfect new mindset when we finally can go out again and be able to um, mingle with other nations and and cultures so we might be more open to it and uh, when we just realize nothing bad can come out of small talk because we have uh, it in our hands where it leads and where it goes. And it can only be something to uplift your spirits and be friendly with each other and maybe yeah. learn a, one thing mm -hmm. or two Brilliant. from another. Yeah. Then that's it. You can, you can go and have your own way again and never meet the person. But at least you have uh, a new encounter or you have a new story or you've made a new friend and uh, nothing bad can come out of that. I mm. think. So mm. let's look Dan, forward to that. Well, mm -hmm. on that, yeah, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, Warren. Yeah, sorry to, 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 to cut across there. Dan, I just thought that the last two comments that we've heard there from Yuka and Claudia are wonderful. And I don't know whether Margaret would agree with me here or not, but as someone that has uh, predominantly spent most of their uh, uh, childhood and adult life in English speaking countries, would, would you, presumably Claudia, uh, uh, fluent obviously in your native tongue of German and also probably in Icelandic and probably several other European countries as well, and the same for Yuka with both Japanese, Icelandic and English, how impressed would you be if a British person was able to converse with you in your native tongue in small talk? <laughs> Just out of interest, because we're very, we're very, very lucky in the fact that effectively the universal language, the language of the universe is English. And we're very fortunate, but it make, boy, does it make us incredibly lazy in terms of linguistics. <laughs> um, Yuka, you want to go first? To be honest, uh, Warren, I don't understand British jokes at all because it just doesn't <laughs> translate into a uh, culture. So I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> we're going to do a podcast on that. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and then go, I have, Claudia. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You, yeah. You go. And plus, um, Japanese language and English or European language is really diff different. And if I start talking about it, it's going to be like too long. But just to, to, in a nutshell, it's just completely opposite way. In the order wise, you say it is, it is not. You know the the positive or negative at the beginning. But in Japanese, it's at the very, very end, you know, if it was a positive or negative synthesis. So um, every time I try to say something, I have to translate everything from Japanese to English and English to Japanese. So it's really confusing for me just to talk in English. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia. You do a great job. Oh, <laughs> I'd love to hear uh, British people speaking uh, German or Japanese or Icelandic. Um, I'd be delighted. And uh, probably a couple of my fellow citizens would uh, uh, be amazed and uh, have a similar look to when you go to Iceland and try to, as a foreigner, speak, try and speak Icelandic to them because they are not used to it, of course. And they are not used to any foreign accents. Um, so uh, they have very big eyes and very big ears and uh, <laughs> grasp for air for a couple of minutes then. Um, <laughs> um, until they actually tell you that it was slightly differently pronounced. 
<laughs> but uh, anyway, um, of course, uh, I think this is something we will actually uh, hear more. People being interested in foreign languages and trying to speak it. And um, it's not unheard of. I can remember that uh, Monty Python actually did two episodes entirely yes, in German indeed. for a German audience. Wow. So it is a very funny thing, a very different thing to Monty Python in English, but still something worth to check out and probably worth to <laughs> retranslate back to English because it will be a gem, I'm sure. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone here. Thank you to Claudia Kussler, Yuka Agura, Warren Moore, Margaret Cavanaugh. Thank you very much. Very entertaining, very informative. Uh, before we close, we'd like to remind our listeners that they can subscribe to our podcast by the button below. Over here, over there can be found on most major podcast platforms. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And today's podcast show notes can be found on our website, over here, over there, dot org. If you want to be a patron, we have a button for that too on our website, and we'd very much appreciate your support. Polite, insightful, humorous, and constructive comments are also welcome in any language. Thank you very much. So please be in touch. Please check out our website for our next unmissable podcast. Until then, thank you for listening to Over Here, Over There. Over here.